Let's discuss cortisol, one of the primary stress hormones. In order to do this, we need to talk about its several tiered regulation, which is controlled at the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So what I have pre-drawn on the board is the hypothalamus is the first step for cortisol secretion. And the way this works is the hypothalamus releases a tropic hormone call, called CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone from clusters of neurons. And the CRH drips out of the hypothalamus into this dense vascular network that I'm drawing in the pink or the red that is sort of superimposed over the neurohypothesial stalk, which is the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So what happens is the CRH goes into these blood vessels, this portal circulation, and it travels through the portal circulation all the way on down to the pituitary gland, the front part of the pituitary gland, which is called the anterior pituitary gland. So that's this part. Now what happens is the corticotropin releasing hormone goes to the anterior pituitary and it prompts the anterior pituitary to make another um, uh, tropic hormone, ACTH, ACTH, from the anterior pituitary, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone. And what that does is it enters then the systemic circulation. It enters the blood and it gets pumped distally from the pituitary out to remote sites. Enter the adrenal glands right above the kidneys. Now, when ACTH makes its way to the adrenal glands, it stimulates a specialized region on the outer shell of the adrenal gland, the cortex, to then synthesize cortisol. And the precursor to cortisol is cholesterol. So cortisol is a steroid hormone and cholesterol is a substrate for the formation of these steroid hormones. So cholesterol metabolism in this sense is quite useful for the production of cortisol. Now when the cortisol is secreted, the physiologic effects that it induces throughout the body are very, very, very diverse and very, very important to think about. So if you look at the effects of cortisol, say, on skeletal muscle, cortisol causes skeletal muscle to start to break down its proteins it liberates some of the amino acids from the, sex, from the skeletal muscle and those amino acids will enter into, the, enter into the bloodstream and they'll circulate all the way on over to the liver and those amino acids will enter into the liver and they will cause the liver to start to produce more glucose from those amino acids. That's a process called gluconeogenesis, new glucose formation from a non-carbohydrate source. So that's very important action of cortisol. It's about protein breakdown. Another thing cortisol does in skeletal muscle is it impairs the ability of glucose in the blood to get taken up into the skeletal muscle because there are 
insulin dependent glucose uptake mechanisms, insulin, glucose uptake mechanisms, where glucose just doesn't freely float in the skeletal muscle, especially when it's at rest. Um, it requires a transporter to come to the membrane from inside, and that, that transporter is called the glute for glucose transporter for transporter. So it kind of works its way up here. Insulin makes that happen. Now, what's really interesting and incredibly important clinically is cortisol inhibits this process. So now glucose doesn't get taken up into the muscle so well. And if glucose doesn't get taken into the muscle, the glucose builds in the plasma. That sort of insulin insensitivity, hyperglycemic effect of glucose can be either a precursor to diabetes or lead to full-blown diabetes, which we know is a, a, a very pathologic uh, disease in its own right. So breaking down skeletal muscle, impairing glucose uptake at the, at the skeletal muscle, very, very important. Another place that cortisol goes are to fat cells. Fat cells are called adipocytes. And what cortisol does in fat cells is it causes the fatty acid chains, which are just long series of carbon chains, to start to get cleaved in a process called lipolysis. And what that allows is those fatty acids get pushed out also into the blood, free fatty acids, from lipolysis. They circulate along with the amino acids, and they also get metabolized in the liver. So you're breaking down fat, you're glucose intolerant, you're breaking down proteins, and the cortisol at the level of the liver is causing new glucose formation from these other precursors, and some of that glucose will also be secreted out going to the blood. So what does that say? That says under situations of stress, perceived stress, physical stress, emotional stress, psychological stress, however you want to define stress, stress then causes hypothalamus to secrete CRH, stimulates ACTH, flows to the blood, goes to the adrenal gland, makes cortisol from cholesterol. Cortisol has actions in muscle, in fat, and in liver, and these are huge metabolic effects resulting in increased blood glucose levels and increased free fatty acid levels. Cortisol also, by the way, causes or increases the activity of catecholamines in constricting blood vessels, so it also has a, a blood pressure um, increasing effect. So stress can change metabolism through this pathway. There's an inhibitory action, a negative feedback scheme that kind of works like this. When cortisol, when cortisol is elevated, that comes back in blood going to the hypothalamus and in blood at the anterior pituitary and it inhibits the subsequent release of CRH and ACTH. Hence, you don't have the, the stimulus to make more cortisol. So if you have cortisol, the stimuli to make cortisol are quenched. Conversely, if you were low on cortisol and you didn't have high concentrations providing an inhibitory effect, more cortisol would be driven out. This can obviously be changed 
with various diseases uh, revolving around cortisol, which we'll talk about in our um, next module.